These non-counted days, or days that were not in the calendar, were set aside to the worship of the gods, and thus came into existence a group of festivals, or of ceremonies, rituals, and rites, which have continued down to us from one culture to another. In the course of time, we have altered these days as to their meaning and the events which they celebrated. But the habit or practice of preserving these great festival days has not to any measure altered or changed. I think the interesting point of symbolism is that the Egyptians held that the great principles of nature and of heaven were assigned to these days as the birthdays of deities. This, this meant that the gods were not born in any year, were not born in any temporal calendar whatsoever, and were thus properly represented as beings of eternity outside of our general concept of time. The timelessness of these deities was thus symbolically established, and the worship of them was held to be beyond the ordinary concerns of men who measured their barter and trade and their months and years by an ordinary calendar. This universality of a concept tells us something that is useful to us uh, even in our present generation, namely that there are principles beyond time. There are principles beyond our measurement or estimation, and there are beings and powers in nature which cannot be captured within our concepts of time and place. These eternal principles were anciently venerated, and we seek to perpetuate in our way, the principles for which these eternal powers were the most primitive and antique symbols. Of these great and mysterious days set aside for the worship of truth in all of its phases and aspects, that which we refer to now as Christmas was an ancient and accepted festival sometimes referred to as the birthday of the sun god. This worship of these days has a, has a number of meanings. Uh, perhaps we can explore a few of them in terms of their present utility. Let us not, therefore, devote too much time to historical factors or to the eternal conflicts of human belief but strive to find what these ceremonies can mean to us as thoughtful persons living in our present century and generation. In the first place, uh, the trend in modern thinking, particularly on the level of social psychology, is the re-evaluation of what might be termed the idea and ideal archetypes of humanity. There are great thoughts that we share, thoughts that have been often obscured in times of benightedness, but have been restored in emergency and under periods of great stress and pressure by which we have been forced back into the recognition of basic values. We are being so forced today by circumstances that weigh heavy upon us. The great problem of our generation is confusion, and confusion is something under which the average person cannot function adequately. To meet the challenge of confusion, we instinctively seek value. We strive once more to discover essential landmarks. We seek road marks and guides by means of which we can continue a reasonable course even under the pressure of unreasonable conditions. 
In this search for value, basic archetypal pattern, it has been observed from the beginning of our experience as human beings that we have always sought consolation and value on the level of basic idea, basic principle. Our only hope has always been that there is a universal truth, that there is a power at the source and root of existence, which is honorable, true, right, good. Without this basic conviction, no civilization has ever been able to restore itself or raise itself above a comparatively savage state. As this conviction has grown dim, cultures have failed. And in every instance, a new culture springing into existence has attained its vitality by restoring this concept of truth, of an eternal principle of reality, toward which we must turn and to which we must periodically rededicate our lives. In order that such dedication may exist, all peoples have set aside days for the celebration of principles. These principles may be either abstract, religious, spiritual, or the manifestation of this power or these powers in the persons of heroes or in circumstances by which we feel that we can recall or revitalize important occasions based in this truth concept. In our own Western way of life, for example, we have not only sacred holidays, but also secular holidays. In all cases, however, the secular holiday is in some way an extension of an ideal or a principle into our daily life. When we celebrate, for example, uh, the declaration of our independence on the 4th of July, we are really celebrating a principle by means of which our nation was brought into fortunate existence. We are celebrating the unselfishness, the dedication, the courage of our forefathers. We are celebrating their strength in right as it was given to them to understand the right. And we celebrate this day because we believe it was a day that was lawful, that it was right in nature and right in spirit, and that those who helped to bring it about ex exemplified in their conduct the very principles which we most deeply admire. Thanksgiving is another day in which we recognize the importance of gratitude which is an aspect of truth. We attempt to express this symbolically through restoring a vision of gratitude and to be restated within our own natures as a fact to give us encouragement and hope for the years that lie ahead. We celebrate the birthdays of our great heroes as Washington and Lincoln. We celebrate the sacrifice of our young men in war and in death in order to preserve the principles which we hold sacred. We celebrate the rights of labor. We celebrate the new year. And we keep all of these festivals because in them we find symbolic monuments of principles that we affirm to be right and proper. Thus even our secular occasions have about them a certain sacredness, because they again are merely our way of recognizing the workings of the law in nature and in human nature. And gradually we elevate to uh, recognition, respect, even almost worship, those in whose lives truth has been the guiding and leading power. Thus, regardless of our confusions and our insecurities, we inwardly recognize that we are under the sovereignty of a pattern, a plan, a purpose that is essentially right. 
we also recognize that this purpose is continually obscured in the courses of our daily actions. We recognize our own limitations and we realize that our selfishness, short-sightedness, and materiality may in many instances deprive these festivals of their deeper significance. Yet we also know that as individuals we have the right to call forth out of ourselves whatever degree of understanding we may possess and therefore that we cannot actually affirm uh, that the profaning of a holiday makes it necessary for us to profane it that the fact that others do not understand is no excuse why we should condemn either the event or even perhaps those who exploit the event. It is for us as persons to seek our securities by the restatement of our own understanding. And regardless of the direction or course of empire, each individual has the right to seek within, in quietude, in peace, and in gratitude, for the source of life, and the source of strength, the source of value in this troubled world. Modern thinkers are beginning to realize that in the, pro, in the prosaic attitudes which they have held, in their general disregard for this sensitivity in man, uh, they have worked a hardship upon human nature. That in the attempt to impose a blanket materialism upon life, they have deprived man of values which are necessary to him. It may not be well to say that they have actually deprived us of these values, because we cannot be deprived of them any more than we can be deprived of life itself and still survive. Yet we have gradually come to interpret out of these events the solemnity and meaning which they held. Until today our festivals become almost a burden upon our flesh. We no longer sense the possibility, the need, and the reality of these important occasions. It is often true that under the pressure of events, our spiritual insight is not always available to us. And just as surely as we need a vacation every year, or we need that annual medical checkup, or we need a certain reunion with our friends and families, so also we need periodically the spiritual remedy of the restatement of our faiths. This restatement is made convenient for us, easy and comparatively simple, by these festivals which set aside times particularly proper and appropriate for such restatement. We may sometimes believe with the scoffer that it is sad indeed that we have to have one Mother's Day a year, that we cannot make our understanding and our appreciation stretch over the whole year. Actually, however, if in that day of recognition we have a deep experience of value, we shall find that our attitudes do stretch better that we will be able to carry a certain lingering remembrance through the entire year. Therefore, these periods of restatement are not the substitution for a good life. They are continual restatements of the reason for a good life. They help us to have courage to face each coming day with greater internal personal resource. Thus, as we look around us all over the world and observe these archetypal days, we realize that they rise primarily from the archetype in ourselves, which in turn is based upon a universal pattern. Man could not have these rhythms of motion in his own consciousness if this consciousness was not rooted in a universal rhythm. The fact that we instinctively perform certain actions will in itself testify to the validity of the motivation behind the more noble and beautiful of these actions. They arise out of something beyond ourselves, and I think we cannot say that we merely copy these habits from each other. 
Because somewhere in the dim source of things there was nothing to copy from. And yet man still, out of his own nature and out of his own instincts, created these patterns. Today, in various primitive parts of the world, where civilization or even organized religion have scarcely penetrated, these festivals are observed and have been since the dawn of time among the most isolated and remote cultural groups. Thus they represent a spontaneous release from ourselves. And I think this morning we are concerned primarily with one of these forms of internal release. The release of something which perhaps we do not fully appreciate or understand, but which challenges us and causes us to sense the over-importance Perhaps this is one of the reasons why we resent the profaning of these days, why we are peculiarly disillusioned when human beings seemingly exploit these most tender and most profound instincts of our lives. Yet this very exploitation may help us because it will help us to restore the value which seemingly disappears. And in our rebellion against exploitation, we may clarify the essential principle and restore it in our own natures and in our own souls. Christianity, as the religion of Western man, has always been rich in festivals. In fact, the calendar of Christian festivals includes in some part of Christendom practically every day of the year. In many nations there are more religious festivals than we observe. And in many parts of the world, a major religious festival may be said to occur at least once weekly. In some places, even oftener. Most of these festivals are, as in the case of secular celebrations, either surrounding spiritual convictions, or else in recognition of the achievement of human beings themselves who have attained extraordinary sanctity by their way of life, and have thus become worthy of veneration, and perhaps through the great machinery of the ancient church were actually raised to sainthood, or to some position approximate to the nature of a divine being. All of these various festivals uh, have their importance in moderating and directing the conduct of persons who must live largely by the glorification of example, who must gain their own courage from the realization that other persons have kept faith, even under the most harrowing conditions. So each of these festivals reminds us of a virtue, reminds us of some quality or some person in whom value has been very clearly and definitely expressed. As these festivals disappear or retire from among us, uh, we lose, therefore, a certain foundation in principles, and we begin to substitute the mere celebration of external situations. We begin to use these days merely as days of leisure, or perhaps as excuses for some kind of secular festivity. To this degree, we have lost an inner contact. Perhaps this contact does remain subconsciously in us but it is not as available as it should be for the end which it is most intended to attain, namely, a re-encouragement of ourselves, a, rec a recognition or restoration of hope, of faith, of love, of friendship, and of understanding. Let it not be said, however, that the profaning of these days can interfere with this. It will interfere only to the degree that we permit it to, and in our own lives we can live as well as we wish to live. We can be as true as we wish to be, and there is no real um, value or merit in the excuse that the pervading of these festivals causes us to become disillusioned in them. We may become a little disillusioned in our way of life, but we cannot be disillusioned in principles because these stand whether they are recognized or ignored, and whatever action is performed in their name in no way changes them. 
It only changes our attitude toward them. And the restoration of our own attitude is very important. There's scarcely a day go by, goes by in which we do not contact persons who are disillusioned, whose internal attitudes are weakened. And these individuals are in desperate need of some kind of encouragement. They wander from one to another seeking this encouragement, but must ultimately recognize that it arises in their own natures, that it cannot be forced upon them, that it cannot be communicated to them in substance. They must find it. And each of these great festivals is a day of encouragement for the individual to find the principles and restate them, principles that he needs in order to live as a common, well-organized member of our present society. And by common we mean not in the sense of the dignity of nature, but things held in common, or held in common good, which is a very important concept, which semantically has become badly confused and distorted. And so we turn to our Christian symbols to see if we can understand something more of this principle we seek. And whether it be in our own faith or in other faiths, nearly all religion is founded upon the building of a valid concept of hope. The individual must live in a world in which he has some basic belief. He has to feel within himself that the power at the root of life is moving life victoriously toward a proper end. That human beings may conceal this end or may work against it, but that the end itself is inevitable. And that therefore we have continuing inducement uh, to keep principles and keep faith with the full recognition that these principles must ultimately succeed. In spite of their obscuration, they will come forth and they will be manifested in this world to the degree that we are capable of retaining and sustaining them in our own conduct. In this way, therefore, the principle of universal hope has been uh, sustained by the honoring of the birthday of the noblest of beings. And in Christendom, this is the birthday of the Christian Messiah. It is in this concept that we honor to our best degree that which has been best among us. We hold the life of Jesus to be a representation, an archetypal example of the way of life for Christendom. We recognize in the strength, the courage, the simplicity, and the constant and eternal love of this person, the highest virtues and values which we attempt to exemplify. We hold this, therefore, to be the celebration of our archetypally perfect being, the being which in our own estimation is the person we would most like to be like. The person who has shown us in personal conduct, in all the vicissitudes of life, that strength and nobility of nature, which to us is most commendable. Let us pause, therefore, and say to ourselves, could a world made up of millions, hundreds of millions of persons in every walk of life, many of them to our minds strangers and unbelievers. Could this concept have survived not only the nineteen and a half centuries of Christendom, but also in principle thousands of years prior to this under other names, under other um, concepts, but always essentially the same principle. Would man have held this festival? Would he have regarded it as important and perpetuated it down through the ages 
unless inside of himself he honestly and sincerely appreciated the principle for which it stands. If this festival had been contrary to his own instincts, if this festival had not received his support psychologically, it could not have endured. It would have been completely impossible for Christmas to have had meaning for us for 1900 years if the being celebrated upon this day was not to our mind the kind of being we want to be. Had it been any other way, it would have perished in limbo. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Roman Caesars were regarded as embodiments of deity. The Caesars were gods and days were set aside for the celebration of them. These days have perished in limbo. No one cares anything about them. The Caesars were not gods. Man never intuitively accepted them as divine. And when the worship of Caesar was uh, introduced into Jerusalem, the people simply rose as a group and rejected it perfectly willing to suffer martyrdom, to die rather than to accept the divinity of a being they could not respect. This happens, and has happened in many peoples and many nations through time. And yet, with all of its vicissitudes, our celebration of the life of Jesus continues because we believe in our own hearts and souls that the, that the ministry which he brought was right. That the sacrifice that he made was valuable, if not unique. That it was important. And that in this pattern is something that rings in ourselves and brings out of us a response that is subjective but intense. A response which refuses to die. A response that is born out of our continuing need for the very principles which he exemplified. Thus psychologically, our Christian festival of Christmas is completely valid. It is valid upon any ground because it is a binding tie by means of which we are held to a principle that we know to be right. We may waver in our allegiances. We may even deny this principle with our conscious minds. We may be disillusioned, agnostic, or atheistic. But in spite of all of these pressures, these celebrations go on. They go on because in the quietude of our own lives, in the pressure of our own emergencies, we find the continuing need for this archetype of sublimity. The sublime nature is the nature we want to believe to be in ourselves. And in this matter, we pray, we hope, we strive according to the intensities of our own abilities to be inspired and encouraged to be like this person. We probably do not succeed, but still the need for this achievement remains unaltered. We look around us in society and subconsciously we realize that if more persons were like this person, we would have a better world. We would have a happier world. And also we gain further encouragement. We realize that this person was able to achieve this, and therefore that such achievement is not unique. Perhaps it is not possible for man alone to accomplish this most noble of all ends. But man has available in him a power and when this power is united to his practice, he has the ability to live above himself. He has the ability to transform his own character 
by the benediction of the life within him. For a number of years, our intellectuals sought to liberate us from the superstition of good. This liberation achieved nothing. In the first place, man simply declined to be internally liberated from any such a concept. And where outwardly uh, these efforts uh, to rescue him for a more secure materialism, these efforts have been attended only by the most dismal of failures. They have indicated clearly that the individual deprived of the concept of an internal, eternal self has been so weakened and so reduced in his efficiencies uh, that he is unable to cope with the problems of the day. As he realizes this, his own revolt begins. And in the last 25 years, the revolt against materialism has extended throughout the world. And it is now being realized that this revolt is against an inconsistency, that man refuses to reject the archetype which he knows is right. He refuses to be evil by nature, or thoughtless, or even simply profane. He is certain in his own mind that without his internal life he cannot survive. And religion to him is always an archetypal symbol of an internal state, a state of retirement into a source of strength interior to himself. As our pressures grow greater, we call upon this internal life we find that it is available. We find countless examples of how this internal life has transformed the external career of the person. We find that in hours of emergency there is strength if we seek it, and we refuse to reject the archetypal concept that has helped us to understand this principle of strength. So every day, the principle of internal resource becomes more urgently meaningful to us. It was perhaps through the ministry of St. Paul that the eternity of this available spiritual strength in man came to be identified with the Christos, or principle of universal salvation. It was by means of Paul's ministry that the historical boundaries of an event were shattered, and this principle flowing out became the priceless heritage of all time. Therefore, that immediately the available power of the divine within made man realize that this power moves with him through the ages through time, through the descent of history, always there, always in a condition of immediate availability. This made out of an historical pattern a greater archetypal pattern, because actually the incident was derived from the archetype, and the archetype, like these deities born upon days which are not on the calendar, is an eternal archetype. Therefore, periodically, among peoples, over the period of ages, heroes have come, great spiritual reformers and leaders, to restore the archetypes, to restore man's recognition of an eternal pattern abiding forever in space around him and space within him. Thus the uh, psychologist may say uh, that the Christ concept is archetypal, but he will also be forced to admit, if he goes further into it, that archetype is not merely a word. Archetype is not merely an idea. Archetype, as Plato pointed out, is a living reality. 
Archetype is a kind of transcendent being. Archetype is the very tracing of the finger of God upon existence. Archetype is the supreme trestle board by means of which the workmen were able to plan the temple of the world. Archetype is the plan at the root of life, a plan which is revealed periodically in every detail of life. Archetype manifests in the chords of music, manifests in the symphonies of color, manifests in architecture and in industry. Wherever there is labor or effort, wherever human expression takes place, this expression can be only in terms of the fulfillment of archetype. That which is contrary to archetype simply fails, lacking cohesiveness, lacking survival, and is finally overwhelmed by the very force moving from the archetype itself. So to us, the archetype of the Christian mystery has a peculiar and wonderful immediacy. And as we come near to this season, millions of persons in all parts of the world will experience a certain degree of mystical at one mystical attunement with a principle of good. And I think we can say uh, without exaggeration that we were never in greater need of this. We were never in a condition in which our internal health uh, was uh, so hazarded as it is today, and that therefore these great archetypal experiences are therapeutic. There is no reason to doubt that the therapy of archetype lies behind nearly all religious healing and, and all so-called sacred miracles. These miracles are merely the scientific release of archetype. They are truth expressing itself in its own way, usually after error has been revealed as a total failure. Thus in our thinking, uh, the so-called anniversary of the birth of Jesus represents the anniversary of the rebirth of an archetypal concept in ourselves. Truth is born in man or through man so the ancients believe, when man himself becomes conscious of this truth. While he is unconscious of it, he lives within archetype. And within this law he moves and has his being, but he is not aware of it. The moment of awareness, when suddenly the truth of these mysteries come home to him, this truth is the birth of this mystery in his own nature. The eternal finds a temporal abode in him when he discovers the conscious experience of the eternal. Thus, in each individual, the annual restoration of his principles represents the annual incarnation of the archetypal pattern in his own nature. By means of this annual incarnation, he is once more strengthened and sanctified and given the courage or the insight with which to face a new year. He is also given new resources within his own nature in the term of conviction and holy dedication by means of which certain good things must be achieved by him in life. If we have this archetypal experience, it is essentially therapeutic. And we must also realize that in all psychotherapy, we cannot depend upon the therapist for a cure. The only thing we can depend upon is a reasonably accurate diagnosis of the condition. What we have to depend upon from the outside is a clearer view of our own mistake to be reminded that we have done something badly, that we have missed value, that we have lost track of truth in some calamity or disaster or some long habit pattern that has disturbed us. For a time our vision has been obscured. Within ourselves we would be kindly beings. 
But for some reason this kindness has been obscured, and in our outer lives we hate. We are suspicious. We gossip. We neglect. We are overly ambitious. We forget our common duties and responsibilities in the effort to seek what enjoyment we think we can find. If this condition goes on, we become uh, subject to psychological depressions. Our abnormal state is simply due to our failure to keep the facts clear in ourselves. We have, this, we have rejected the victory of beauty over utility. We have rejected the importance of giving and have overemphasized the importance of gaining. We have made mistakes. These mistakes have made us sick. For wherever we make a mistake, we will be sick. There is no possible evasion. Because the moment we go contrary to the life in ourselves, we declare war upon this life. We declare ourselves to be outside of its protection and shelter. And the moment we attempt this isolated condition, we become sick. Sickness is the individual being out of harmony with the supreme purpose for himself. I believe we will ultimately discover that at the root of man's moral and ethical archetype there is a censorship, a censorship which we slightly recognize under the rather distorted form of conscience. But there is a true censorship, and we are either with this power or we are against this power. There can be no willy-nilly middle ground. We are either standing with our own internal insight or we are denying that insight. And the moment we deny it, neglect it, ignore it, or go against it, we cut ourselves off from the living tree of which we are a part. And like the withered branch, we are cast into the fires of our own unhappiness. The moment we cut ourselves off from this living tree, we are also deprived of our source of life and of our fruitfulness and of the rich harvest which might come in the psychic development of our own lives. Thus this conflict between our conduct and the internal pattern for our being has to be in some way overcome. We have to become again aligned with the value in our own nature. No therapist can do this for us. The majority of therapists are totally at loss in connection with man's spiritual requirements. The modern tendencies of religion do not always succeed either, for the reason that religion is sectarian and man's archetype is not sectarian. That religion imposes certain uh, rules which are not archetypally acceptable. Religion has so many arbitrary beliefs that arose not in the great mystery of faith itself, but in man's interpretations thereof. Thus we are not always able to find the full consolation that we seek. One direction after another we turn, always to discover that there is something that is not quite acceptable, something with which we become disillusioned. Uh, individuals who seemingly practice spiritual virtues, so live that we cannot accept their lives as examples, as we have accepted the great examples of our world teachers. Ultimately, we are forced back upon our own resources. We are forced to search in ourselves for that which is in conformity with our own insight. And when we have made this search and have discovered this insight, then we are on our way uh, to remedial <coughs> therapy. For therapy in every case must have its root in man's returning to the principles upon which his life is fashioned. And as he seeks these principles, he seeks them through inward contemplation. And he also seeks them through the great revelations of those whom he accepts as having lived these principles in a proper and complete manner 
or as near a complete manner as is possible to a mortal being. If then on this occasion we should make Christmas important to ourselves, it should be a time in which we do set aside a certain amount of time or energy to the quiet contemplation of the archetypal mystery of good, the archetypal mystery of faith, and the archetypal mystery of the victory of soul power over material power in all things. We must seek to regain this contact with ourselves, for in regaining it, we reestablish our identity with it and receive from within ourselves this supply of courage, this supply of value and insight, which will enable us to continue in a more noble existence, not only in the year ahead, but perhaps for the rest of our lives. The great possibility, therefore, is the mystical experience of the resurrection or restoration in ourselves of the concept that each person is a living embodiment of truth, that each person contains within himself this ever-flowing fountain of divine courage, that each of us has a Christ in us, the hope of glory, and that in this restoration of this vision, we reunite ourselves at least temporarily with the archetypal acceptances, which bring with them consistent living, orderly thinking, self-control, and a sense of security and inward peace. Attainment of archetype is attainment of internal tranquility. The person who has attained this union is no longer at conflict with himself, and when conflict with self ceases, conflict with the world becomes unimportant. For the world in with which we are in conflict is our own nature. Our own confusion spread forth upon other things, reflected back to us from the intemperances of our times. Thus the establishment of integration uh, in a psychological term means the security of the individual united with the truth core of his own nature. Each individual with this truth core is a majority, and against this truth core no negative situation can stand. The realization that this security is beyond price, that it is more important than anything we are trying to accomplish in life, this realization must come to us, because it is a realization locked in ourselves, a realization we have always accepted, a realization which comes to us in the simple and firm belief that in the time to come there will be a golden age which will be ruled over by the divine power, and that before this divine power all knees shall bend and the sovereignty of this power shall be universally recognized, and that this and this only can bring about the world peace, the world tranquility, the world security that we are all so desperately seeking, often with so little real courage or insight. Now, in connection with the Christian mystery also, we come upon a series of symbols that are likewise archetypal, and they all have to do with essential concepts uh, which, which can become alive in us, can become very meaningful in our own uh, thinking and in our own living. The earliest known symbol of Christianity, by means of which the faith was anciently distinguished, was the sign of the fish. In ancient times, in those days of Roman persecution, when Christians met, they would take the tip of their staffs and they would make a drawing upon the sand or earth before them, a simple symbol of a fish. This was their method of recognition, and once having recognized each other, 
they then scattered the symbol with their foot in order that it might not survive to be used against them at some future time. This symbol was derived from the concept of the calling of the apostles in which Jesus declared that he would make them fishers of men. Up to uh, the present time, the supreme symbol of the Roman pontiff is the fisherman's ring, the symbol, again, of the concept of the fisher of men. Now this symbol is a little difficult, perhaps, for us to completely understand, but it represents, it seems to me, a, a very important basic concept, derived again from antiquity and gradually Christianized over a period of time. This concept is archetypal. Man recognized the sea, the ocean, as a peculiar and tremendous archetypal symbol. When we realize that over half of the earth's surface is composed of sea and ocean, and that in the depths of it are mysteries far beyond our comprehension, that even today we have never explored it even to a fragment of the degree that we have explored the air. We realize that the ocean or the sea has a great and wonderful power. The surface of it moved by the waves and currents of time, breaking with storm, and yet this same ocean forming the ancient highway which bound nations together. For among the earliest of man's achievements, were simple forms of navigation by means of which he could use the sea as a road. He also derived his nutrition from the sea, and many peoples living along the shores of the sea depended upon fish for their survival. Not only the seas, but the lakes, the rivers, and the streams therefore became highly symbolic. When it was that man first intuitively realized that he was born out of the sea, we do not know. But even modern science points definitely to the fact that the ocean was the original land of life, and that from the sea creatures crawled out upon the land, gradually becoming amphibious, and finally gaining an, an existence out of the ocean, but still dependent upon water, very largely for survival. This mystery of the sea was therefore the mystery of origin, and among most ancient peoples, the sea was the symbol of life. It was the symbol of archetype. It was the symbol of the great, unexplored depths in which all things existed. The sea also became the proper and natural emblem of vitality, of the life principle, of generation, and of germination. And the fish in, existing in the sea became, so to say, very much like man existing in the air. For as the fish is drowned in the air, so man can be drowned in the sea. The fish, therefore, lives in an element in which it has a natural subsistence. Man living also in an element of air in which he has a natural subsistence. But to the ancients, the sea became also a symbol of the air. It became a symbol of the pressure or the presence of an invisible environment in which all forms of life existed. Because all life came from the sea, the sea also became a symbol of universal life. It became a symbol of the universal energy in which all things had a common sharing and among ancient peoples the sea became an emblem of the tremendous field of spiritual energy within which all creatures lived and moved and had their being. And it also became the symbol of a dark mystery, the mystery of the human unconscious, the, history, the mystery of the human subconscious. And today an archetypal dreaming, the dream of the sea and of great storms, or of tidal waves, or of vast immersions in water, or of floods, or the sinking of continents under the sea. All of these have to do with mystery, with the unconscious root of life, with the vast archetypal ocean. 
into which all things seemingly are submerged, and from which in the dawn of things all things emerged to become life. Therefore the sea is the root of man's concept of existence. The sea is the very eternal cosmic all. A man lives not only surrounded by and permeated by this all, but when he goes inside of himself, he suddenly stands upon the shores of a great sea, a sea that is eternal and extends inwardly throughout the whole mystery of being. To the ancient Buddhists, this sea was the symbol of nirvana, or the end of existence. It was the mystery of the unknown cause of things, the mystery of the unknown end of things. And the ancient name for the sea was Mari. And the mother of Buddha was Mari or Maya, a symbol of the oceans. The uh, symbol of Mary, the name Mary, comes from the sea, from the great ocean of life, from the eternal mystery of the spiritual substance from which all things are immaculately conceived and born. Therefore the sea is the symbol of the eternal life-giving power of the infinite. It is the symbol of the mysterious humidity in which all things are generated and have their own existence. And in this sea there are these fish creatures many of them strangely shaped and different from any creature upon the land. But to the ancients, in their symbolism of the great sea, the fishes became archetypal emblems. They represented the sperms of life. They represented the first manifestations of forms out of the infinite. Therefore, in man they are also basic ideas, existing forever in the sea of life. They are the great archetypes. They are the patterns that are first projected from the patternless. They live only in their own element. When they come forth out of that element into the air of mortal man, they die. Therefore, these creatures can never be completely brought out of their ocean. Any more than man can dive into his own subconscious without drowning. Thus, each of these elements is strangely separate. Yet man lives along the shores of the sea and depends upon it for his life. And man also depends upon the air. So the air became the symbol of his outer life and the sea of his inner life. And the individual gazing toward the source of his own being sees at best only the surface of a mighty ocean, the depths of which are beyond his comprehension and understanding. The ancients believed that visions and dreams were man moving out into this sea, that all of the changes in his psychic life were like storms moving the surface of his subconscious and unconscious parts. But beneath the surface of the storms, beneath the ocean, there was always quietude. There was inevitable and eternal calm. Yet also in this depth, there might be currents, waves, and methods of motion. There might be great rivers in the sea, and we now know that there are. That there might be lakes and rivulets and streams within the sea itself. Thus we are uh, more or less equipped to recognize the possibility that in this sea of archetype, this sea of universal, there are courses and currents and motions, and these we term the movements of eternal law, which has its abode within the strange depths of the archetypal ocean. And on the surface or near the surface are the small fishes, those that we are able to see and upon which to a de degree we depend from poor life. For well, we catch these fishes, and they become our food. And in the uh, we remember the words of St. Augustine, who declared that Christ was a fish, caught, taken out of the sea, cooked and eaten for our salvation. 
This is all archetypal symbolism. But it is also apparent that by these fish in the eternal ocean are the germs of life properly symbolized, that they represent the germs of our own consciousness, that man's consciousness is a fish in the sea of his unconscious, that man's consciousness lives in a different element from the material world in which his body subsides or exists, that when this body is cast into its own internal, it perishes, but when the internal is brought out of its own element, it likewise perishes. For there is a certain division, a certain differentiation, and when the fish is brought out of the sea, it dies. And yet in dying it has a certain service to perform. Thus our dreams, our purposes, our principles, while we hold them in ourselves, have an eternal existence. Yet when we bring them out into manifestation and use them to build structures or to build patterns, these patterns are mortal and are subject to death. And it is our apparent conviction that with these mortal forms perishes the idea behind them. This is not true. The idea returns to the sea, but the patterns formed in themselves are perishable. Thus man has an existence in eternity, in the great sea of life. He also has an existence in time, and his existence in time is mutable and is not permanent, but subject to eternal and everlasting change and modification. Thus the fish symbol became to these ancient peoples the proper emblem of the divine power of life. Also the capturing of the fish in the nets became a symbol of man's mental, emotional, physical effort by means of which he was able to capture ideas in the net of reason, how he was able to reach into himself and capture principles, and bringing them out, use them for the nourishment of his own life. Thus these fishes which are captured can be read in two ways. Either they represent mortality, humanity, the outer fish in the ocean of air, captured and held, by the great fishermen, or they may also represent man capturing out of his own inner life the germs of his own great action and conduct. If therefore Schubert tells us that he heard first the melodies that he composed in the air around him, if we discover that great inventions come from dreams and sleepings and from visions, then it would seem that man is a fisherman, fishing in the midst of his own unconscious life, drawing out from the sea of the subconscious the archetypal patterns that are there, causing them to become the instruments of his purpose, for actually his reality, his true light, his achievements, are all real only to the degree that they are archetypal. Thus in ancient Christianity, the fish became the symbol of the divine archetype, the perfect pattern, that there are true principles ever available to man, and that by seeking within the depths of himself, he shall discover creatures that abide there, that have no place in his outer world, and that in these creatures he discovers a new kind of nutrition. He finds the life upon which he may feed and not again hunger. And in the same way, the waters of life or the waters of eternity are different from the waters of earth. For man drinking of the waters of earth shall thirst again, but those who drink of the living waters shall thirst no more. These living waters, the great ocean, the virgin sea, the great uh, mother of mysteries, always this symbolism conveys the resources of man's internal life. It reveals to the individual the potential that is locked within himself, by the restoration of which he restores his ancient dignity and finds again the ever-flowing fountains of inspiration and courage. Another symbol that has been long and often associated with Christianity, particularly 
after about the 4th century, was the sign of the cross. This symbol, of course, like all others, has an ancient history, going back to ancient times. We associate it now largely with the crucifixion of Christ. But the cross has another broad and general meaning. The cross represents essentially cross purposes. It represents, and was known to the ancients, always as an emblem of conflict. It represented to the Egyptian, with certain modifications, uh, the symbol of the inundation of the Nile. It was based upon what was called the Nilometer. And in this form, when a certain degree of water caused the Nile to rise, then these two pieces of wood formed a right angle, and this was the cross which became the symbol of life because the inundation of the Nile was the symbol of life uh, to the Egyptian. In the Roman and uh, Grecian culture, however, the cross was the symbol of death. It was the symbol of punishment for the peculiar crimes of sedition against the state of treason and similar things. But from the oldest possible time, the cross was the symbol of a horizontal energy and a vertical energy, one passing through the other. It was therefore a symbol of God and nature. It was a symbol of heaven and earth, of spirit and matter, of consciousness and force. It was always the symbol, likewise, of the great cross of the year, the equinoxes and the solstices. And it was upon this great heavenly cross that the sun deity was crucified. It was the symbol of the primordial formation of bodies and form, for the first visible development of a human or other cell recorded by science is a cruciform a split at the north polar extremity of the cell in the process of multiplication. Thus the, the cross was the symbol essentially of life moving into matter. It also, however, has another interesting meaning to us archetypally. It is the sign of plus. And in mathematics and other signs, it is the sign of addition. Something is added. The St. Andrew's cross is the symbol of multiplication. And this also gives us very definite symbolic meaning. But for our present purpose, the cross of Christendom always represents the crossing of lines of force and also the symbol of something that is added or an addition to something or the power of things to be added to each other in some mysterious way. If we study the two symbols we can understand something of this. Heaven plus earth, or heaven cross earth, was the basic formula for the generation of man. Therefore man was the child of heaven and earth. Man was the creature in which heaven and earth were revealed. Spirit plus matter equals form. Therefore out of the plus, comes something important in each case. Spirit and body, uh, or spirit plus body, equals soul. The soul must be a production of these two. Therefore, we say that this plus, male plus female, equal progeny. Always something is added. And this addition in the Christian mystery has something to do with the explanation for the experiences of life as we know them. For in our experience, uh, we are sometimes tempted to wonder how it may be that any good thing shall come out of Nazareth, how this tremendous struggle that we have in life can ever produce value equal to its own emergencies, and how it is necessary 
for life to pass through this mystery of birth, death, and resurrection in order that the will of heaven be fulfilled in its creation. I think we begin to experience the problem when we realize that the union of these two opposites, separated by the plus sign and united by them, this union is an achievement by means of which an alchemy or a mystery is wrought within the archetype of man himself. Man is an inward being flowing out through an outward being. But we have forgotten that man must be fruitful. Today our tendency is to assume that our internal energies flowing outward through our activities may be simply dissipated, that they simply go on and vanish in thin air. The individual is using energy merely to perpetuate himself. He is using energy simply to achieve his own purpose. And that purpose may or may not have any similitude to divine purpose. Here he is making this mistake. Energy is not given to us merely to be wasted. There must be a product. There must be something attained. And in the spiritual life of man, this energy plus bodily existence equals experience. And experience is the mysterious transformation of theory into fact. Experience is the discovery of truth. It is also the recognition of error. Experience is that procedure by means of which all things in themselves theoretical are brought into a formal and inevitable state. We are told in the ancient scriptures, for example, that the angels remained with God in heaven, and that therefore the time shall come when man, because he fell upon nature and into nature, and went through experiences in nature, shall become greater than the angels. This greaterness is due to the experience of existence. This experience in which man deprived temporarily by the obscuring power of matter of his birthright becomes like the prodigal son, a wanderer of the face of the earth. How gradually he reclaims his heritage. How by a virtuous and personal effort he explores his own nature, discovering finally that the reason for his existence is that he shall discover himself, and that this discovery brings about a change in the relationship between archetype and the exterior experience of the person. Therefore, the revelation of the divine through the human results in the creation of the great psychic entity which we call the soul. And the soul which is born, as we might say, amidst animals, is born weak and helpless as an infant out of the sea of mystery, its virgin mother. This experienced creature, this soul entity, is finally to become the real entity in the being. This soul is to attain victory over body. It is to become the living bridge between heaven and earth. It is to become the great reconciler of all opposites. It is the mysterious alchemical mercury by means, which, by means of which all base metals shall ultimately be transformed into pure gold. Therefore, the archetype plus the objective experience of man equals the increasing wealth of the psychic life. The ultimate realization that man is a psychic being, not a physical being. And that the reorientation of himself upon the psychic level means the end of stress. It means then and then only that he shall be able to be compatible for the purpose of his own nature. Thus this crossing of spiritual and material value 
becomes for man an archetypal symbol of his proper state. It also becomes the archetypal symbol of the abuse by means of which he destroys through his ignorance, through his superstition, and through his fear. Mm. That he uses this symbol not as a symbol of addition, but as a symbol of punishment. And so we use it in our daily thinking. To us, experience is not opportunity, it is punishment. To us, pain is not privilege, it is punishment. To us, the fact that we must do certain things that we do not now want to do is not lawfulness, but punishment. The frustration of our ambition is punishment. Anything that prevents us from continuing the habits which we have generally developed becomes our symbol of limitation, restraint, punishment, martyrdom, death. Yet the purpose of the relationship of life to matter is not the purpose of death. It is the purpose of the creation of this symbol of resurrection and regeneration. This symbol by which the instrument of torment is transformed into the symbol of hope. Because it is this experience which we now reject, which is truly the stone which the builder rejected, and which must in time become the head of the corner. It is therefore our privilege and our right to transform the cross we carry from the symbol of punishment to the symbol of addition, to the symbol of that power by means of which we shall transform all things earthy into things which have in themselves a heavenly subsistence, that we shall find in the cross we bear the secret of the crown we seek. And while these archetypal symbols have been misused through the ages, it is strange how many of the old truisms come back again to us as we proceed to understand the story in its beauty and in its magnitude. Now we also know that at this season of the year, the mysterious rise of the Christian star and the journey of the wise men out of the east has peculiar archetypal symbolism for us. We wonder who these wise men may be and why they come to worship at the crib of the newborn symbol of life. The star, which is representative of also archetypal symbolism, occurs again in the psychological experiences of many persons. We, uh, through a long association, have come to identify this brilliant star with the symbol of our salvation and our hope. But actually the star symbol existed in our consciousness long before that mysterious occurrence. The Pythagoreans in the 5th and 6th centuries before the beginning of the Christian era had a star of five points which they call the pentalpha, inasmuch as it was composed of five characters for the Greek letter A, or alpha. The pentalpha was to Pythagoras the symbol of healing, the symbol of equilibrium, and the symbol of man. It was to him likewise a mathematical mystery, inasmuch as it contained within its mysterious formula uh, the archetypal pattern of certain aspects of man's psychic existence. In the psychological theory, therefore, the breaking of a star, the appearance of a radiant point of light, was to the psychic, or to the psychologist of ancient times, who was then the psychic, uh, was the symbol of the emergence of a conscious unit, in other words, a star or a symbol was the fundamental archetype of awareness. Just as the great laws impressed themselves upon man, perhaps through the archetype of the fish, so the dawn of a particular awareness was like a flash or a star or a spark 
within man. Consciousness was a spark. This spark was a star. This star was not the archetype of the universe moving in upon him. It was the dawning or awaking of his own unit of consciousness. Therefore the star was the symbol of the dawn of the conscious entity in man. It was the symbol of an idea, the symbol of a basic value of which man suddenly attained awareness. It might therefore be a consummation of whatever experiences caused man to suddenly shine with understanding inside himself. The star was therefore to a measure the symbol of the archetype of the soul unit, the psychic self which was gradually to come and the promise of which was in the form of the star. Various explanations have been given for the three wise men and the gifts which they brought. I think in the 20th century our understanding of these wise men should be uh, that man has three groups of attributes. These three groups of attributes are incidentally rather well personified by the three principal races of the earth. And from these races, according to the story and according to the complexion of these wise men, these sages originally came. Man has a series of powers, uh, which of themselves may be tyrants, but which when brought together for the worship of the psychic unit, can become the great servants of all things that are good. Man's primary contribution is therefore a, to our thinking physical, labor. Man brought in ancient times the fruits of the land which he had cultivated with his hands. He built, he struggled, he fought with his hands for the preservation of his kind. Therefore the labors of our hands, our daily work, represent activity. And this physical activity represents one of the wise men. Our emotional activity has given us art and music. It has given us a great part of literature and poetry and drama. It has given us inspiration and religion. It has brought us all kinds of soul enrichment. And this, therefore, representing our emotional uh, wealth, the emotional power within us to build may be considered as one of the wise men. And the third of these is reason, the power of the mind itself. The intellect, by means of which we explore all nature, and have sought to bring the unknown within the boundaries of the known. The mind, therefore, makes the offering of philosophy, of science, of innumerable attainments for us, and is a good and useful servant of this compound personality which is ourselves. Therefore these three, the mind, the heart, and the hand, come and bow before uh, the mystery of the birth of consciousness in man. It is this birth of consciousness which makes the heart, the mind, and the hand the servants of the self. Until this central consciousness demands and receives the homage of our intellect, our emotions, and our actions, these have a certain existence in themselves, and in this existence they may go to excess and extreme and even destroy us. Because if we reason without consciousness, we lose the basic value of reasoning and thinking. If our emotions are not lighted by the star in ourselves, they are selfish and negative. If our actions are not purposed by a divine archetypal plan within our natures, they labor in vain who seek to build. Thus in the symbolism, the achievements of the outer life, represented by the three wise instruments, or servants, or purposes, or skills which we possess, come to offer themselves to our service because they have seen the star in the east. They have seen the dawn of consciousness 
and have realized that consciousness is their natural and proper ruler, and that each of them <laughs> fulfills its labor properly only when it is moved by the archetype of life within ourselves. Thus they come, willingly and dedicate themselves to the service of the eternal. We may not realize this experience in our daily living, but it is simpler than we know, and it happens to us and we never even sense the, the correlation or the parallel in the symbolism. An individual goes along working day by day, doing the things he's always done in the way he has always done them, and then suddenly something happens to him. He has a little insight. He finds that he has a new understanding of something. Perhaps the door is opened in his consciousness and there is a little more of wealth, a little more of depth in him. Almost instantly, the things he does take on new meaning. The individual who spent all his time selfishly doing unimportant things suddenly finds that there is a reason for what he is doing. So instead of using his skills just to achieve the old purposelessness, he suddenly finds that instinctively and without effort, he is making things for a purpose. I know a case of a man, for instance, who had a little uh, craft shop in which he made all kinds of chairs and dishes and bowls and cups and things that nobody really wanted. He gave them to all his friends until his friends didn't want any more. It was his interest in his avocation. And suddenly he became very much interested in the Boy Scout movement. Here was an opportunity for service. Within a few weeks he had all those boys in his craft shop. And he was showing them how to make things and build things. And he had suddenly discovered a new reason for this craft shop and a new use of his time, which was much more meaningful to him than was probably keeping young people off the street where they so easily got into difficulty. Suddenly, his new idea bound him to a new use of the things that he had. In other words, in him, a wise man had come to worship at the altar of a greater principle. In him, this skill now was apprenticed to a Con conception, a conviction, a belief, a new value was there. Thus, whenever we become more internally conscious, the things that we do become rededicated, and the heart, the mind, and the hand come to offer themselves to the eternal truth we have discovered. Thus, these symbols go on archetypally working with us every day. The great archetype of Christmas as a festival, it seems to me, therefore, is one in which we seek meanings, seek to discover gentle and beautiful truths we have always known to be there. But we have made these truths too historical, we have bound them too much to other people, we have held them too tightly within the bonds of sects and creeds. We have not allowed them to become simple, gentle, happy experiences moving into our own lives. We have not applied them to our particular need at the moment and found through this application a new symbolic wealth, <coughs> a new concept of archetype by which we are encouraged and strengthened to face the day with a better hope. If we bring all these things to bear upon our own lives, we shall then have not only a more beautiful Christmas, but strangely enough, we will have a very scientific Christmas. We will discover that all of these laws and principles are true. That they are true not by theological uh, stand alone, <clears throat> but they are true because they represent inevitable motions of our own hopes our own beliefs, our own inward desire for beauty and truth and understanding and sympathy and friendship. And as we begin to work with these principles, we will rescue these sacred days from the comparatively superficial situation into which they have fallen, and we will realize why, in spite of their exploitation, we cling to them. We cling to them because we need them. 
And we cling to them because they make our hearts sing, even though we are not always consciously able to live the principles involved. And on that basis, I think we can all face Christmas with a greater degree of understanding and a determination to make it an experience within our own lives. If we do this, we shall really have a very merry Christmas. Amen.